morning. I'd like to welcome everyone here. Um, for our visitors, we're, we're talking about Christian Avanetsis. Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 3 tells us, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the people of old receive their condemnation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So, where we study creation versus um, evolution because both of these are a faith issue. We know ours is a faith issue, but they're also believing in things they haven't seen. And it, and it takes a lot more faith actually to try to believe what, what they propose. And, and that's a lot of what we've been talking about. We also are told in 1 Peter 3, 15, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So we're, we try to, um, I know this isn't so much a Bible study, a lot of it is other stuff, but that's that's why we're looking at this. So so last week we, we were talking about or finished up on talking a, a bit on um, mutations, page 25. We talked about mutations and how they can be good, bad, or neutral. I don't think I made a copy of page yeah, 25, but um, you look at most good ones are very rare. In fact, extremely rare. 99% of them are negative when there's a mutation, and significant mutations are pretty much especially detrimental or lethal. But the reason we talked about that was successful macroevolution requires the addition of new information through mutations. New genes have to be added. You can't take genes away. We're going to talk about that more, maybe not today, but in another week. And so you have to have big, significant changes. And again, that doesn't tend to happen except in a negative way. Um, there are mutations. People have mutations. There are folks that have, you know, everything from Siamese twins to, to, you know, folks that we talked about after class a little bit, folks that used to work at the circus. You know, these things happen, um, but it's usually a bad thing. So let's go on into page 26, homology. And this is the evolutionist talk about that we have a common ancestor. Okay, and this is a cornerstone of their evolutionary theory, that you, you look at the things that are common between animals, and that's what's going to prove evolution. And this... Um, the basic similarities that exist between different groups, and that's homology. Um, much of the case for amoeba to man evolution is built upon these arguments of similarity. Evolutionists argue that if similarity can be shown between organisms through comparative anatomy, embryology, vestigal organs, cytology, blood chemistry, protein, DNA, biochemistry, then the evolutionary relationship can be proven. So that's their case. Darwin himself wrote back in his book, The Origin of Species, we have seen that the members of the same class independently of their habits of life resemble each other in the general plan of their organization, if not powerfully, powerfully suggestive of true relationship of inheritance from a common ancestor. So Darwin started out with the common ancestor. You see common traits, you had a common ancestor. We all came and evolved from one, one spot. Encyclopedia Britannica in 1981. And you know, growing up, we had Encyclopedia Britannica. You know, I don't know if y'all had a set of those in your house. You know, we had World Book. World Book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you had one or the other before the internet. You know, this was um, if your parents could afford it. 
so the encyclopedia said the indirect evidence for evolution is based primarily on the significance of similarities found in different organisms. And it goes on saying, in vertebrate animals, the skeleton of the forelimb is a splendid example of homology, and the bones of the upper arm, the forearm, the wrist, hand, and fingers, all of which can be matched bone for bone in rats, dogs, horses, bats, moles, porpoises, and man. The example of, of all the more telling because the bones have become modified in adaptation to different modes of life but have retained the same found fundamental plan of structure inherited from a common ancestor. So this is, this is where they're at. Um, Isaac Asmanov, the late biochemist, um, wrote that the ability to classify plants and animals in groups within groups, hierarchical, yeah, <laughs> basis, forces scientists to treat evolution as a fact. So because you can classify plants and animals into groups, that makes evolution a fact. Okay? That doesn't make it any more a fact than the Dewey Decimal System makes the library more organized. <laughs> you know, it's just a system. It's okay. Um, and this appears to be a logical argument. When you look at it, you go, hey, yeah, you think about these bones, you know, that kind of makes some sense. Um, you know, they're going to point out that the, the wing of the bat and the forefoot of a turtle, um, forefoot of a frog, the arm of a man, all have the same general structure. And we look at that and go, okay, um, even the flipper of a whale. Um, the lesson isn't that, that we dispute the data. It's how you interpret the data. Okay, so the question isn't, are these things similar in that way? The question is, well, what do you make of things, animals that are similar? And of course, they're going to argue that it proves that it's a common ancestor, and we need to argue or consider that it's a common designer. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. If you, if you look at your vehicle, if you have a Chevy, um, I used to deal with, with um, Chevy, you go to a plant and they run endurable, they made vans, and they have Chevy, they had the Plymouth, or not Plymouth, the Pontiac. They had the Cadillac. They had all of the different vehicles. They all have the same engine, transmission, all of the suspension. Every part of the vehicle is common. And is it a common ancestor? Well, no, they're made from scratch. They have a common designer. So the designer designs this vehicle and they put different trim and different fascias on it and then one of them is going to come out looking a little nicer you get your Buick you know and it's going to have more chrome on it and you get a Cadillac truck versus a Chevy truck and 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 it's going to cost a lot more and it's going to have some nicer like fake wood trim on it or something okay but it has a common designer so we we wouldn't look at a vehicle and go well, you know, this, I saw this and I saw that, and it proves evolution. We look at it and you go, hmm, okay, so someone figured this out, and they used the same engine throughout all of the different lines. So there is similarity, and, and we don't necessarily want to argue that there is not, but we want to talk about that there is also dissimilarity. So if you can use this this theory that they have, the law of similarity to show evolution, then dissimilarities can use to be used to prove it's not true. Okay. So I was teaching something like this a couple a few years ago, but uh, one of the scientists that we were studying was talking about like going back to the art. You know, he didn't have like twenty like Great Danes. You know. Bulldog, you know, he didn't have like all the different things. 
and what they called it, basically the, their study of it was called like a, a front-loaded organism. So there was this canine species that not necessarily was an individual thing, but it's this, this main front-loaded organism, and then whenever you know you have the wild dogs in Australia, well, they're short-haired, and so because of their front-loaded organism, and they have that DNA makeup, and they have all the right makeup to be able to adapt to that hot weather, whereas opposed to you have a canine that goes into the cold Arctic that can adapt to create, create that long hair, creates wool. So, so the front-loaded organism is just the one specific canine species, but, allows, but it has that genetic makeup to allow it to adapt as needed, and then eventually, you know, you have the different type of similar things, and that was that was kind of eye-opening for me, I think. Yeah, this so. is this is a bunch of great points because we we've already acknowledged that you have microevolution. You have, you know, a baby comes out with maybe different colored eyes. You know, these things we know about, and that little changes happen within the species, but we we dis, um, disagree that there's macroevolution. It's also a great point because you think about common ancestors. You mentioned the ark. Well, it's like, well, we all came from Noah or his kids. You know, we're not going to argue against that. And, and Adam and Eve in the beginning. So there, there is common ancestry among man. There's common ancestry among, among different animals. But the, the question is, can they prove that we are related to a monkey? That's, that's where we disagree. So we, we're going to spend time on where they're going to pick and choose where things are similar, you know, the bones of the arm and the hand. Um, one can also pick and choose where things are not similar and disprove that theory. Okay, so and I, I know that there are dissimilarities and we're going to talk about those and that there is a pattern of evidence of diversity, but we also know that there are multiple, and I've listed a few here on the page, of these phenomenon which do not fit into their similarity model. Um, they talk about the octopus eye, a pig's heart, um, different things are very similar, but it does that prove um, that, that they evolved from the same thing. So if we look at, at the first example, the weight of the brain. Okay, so you're going to say the weight of the brain um, is proportional to body weight. If you look at that ratio, then it's going to be greater, the weight of the brain is going to be greater for a little monkey in South America, the marmoset, than it is for man. And we think, well, we're both the most evolved. We should have the highest level of brain mass to body weight. Um, but then that's not true. This proportion um, is, is better for primates than it is for man. Then we look at another example, which is the bacteria that caused the plague. And I can't say the name of it. It's this long uh, chemical name. That bacteria only affects man and rodents. Does this show, why doesn't it affect all animals if it can affect man and rodents? If, it's, if everything is common, why doesn't the plague of bacteria affect everything else? We see that even more specifically recently. We think about COVID, and at first they said, well, COVID may have came from bats, eating bats in China. And I don't think it did, but it's okay. Um, we know there are flu, types of flu. Bird flu has been in, in Kentucky, and bird flu can, can affect chickens, and, and strains of bird flu can affect humans, but it doesn't go in other animals. There are other swine flu, for example, that was pigs, and, and they were concerned about it getting in people. So why is, if everything is all the same, then why isn't there one kind of flu and every animal gets it? Um, so there, there are differences. Um, the next one, the plant nettle or steam nettle. Um, we had those where I grew up in Florida. They're, they're these little plants and they're little 
just scrawny looking plants and they have um, stickers on them but not stickers like you're used to around here where you get into it and it pokes the hole in you. They're just real fine like hairs almost. But if you touch one, it stings <coughs> the fool out of you. You learn as a kid, <laughs> you know, you figure out pretty quick like don't touch that because it, it, it hurts. Um, well they have um, different chemicals in there and I've listed on the handout one of them is this 5-hydroxo something or other but they also have histamine and it's interesting because those chemicals obviously are found in the stinging nettle those chemicals are found in man so are we more closely related to a stinging nettle than we are to other animals which don't have that and the answer is well I don't think so then it, they make the point about uh, the different legumes, which are like um, peas or beans or um, the, there's different crops that are legumes. They have nodules on the roots get on there. And those nodules can happen, we're going to talk about nematodes, but nematodes bite it makes nodules. So the nodules on the legume plants and the crustacean Daphnia contain hemoglobin. Well, hemoglobin is in our blood, and it's critical to our blood. So can we say that we're closely related to root nodules and a crustacean or not? You know, why do other animals not have that? Another one would be the test of specific gravity tests that run on blood, so you measure the specific gravity, the density of blood, and it was found out that the density for a frog and a snake are more similar to man than that of a monkey. So again, it wouldn't show that we're closer related to a monkey. If so, those, those measurements should match up closer and closer as you looked at the monkeys that were our closest relatives and not necessarily match up well with frogs and snakes. Some people are snakes, but that's just by their nature. Okay, so another is the concentration of red blood cells. So if you, you look at the concentration in the blood, millions per cubic millimeter, um, man's blood is more similar to frogs, fish, and birds than it is to sheep um, and other mammals. So. It's interesting that our blood make up. I just thought that was interesting. Another one, and I think um, we'll, we'll press on after this. Um, bones are often shown, you know, they, we talked about the bones in the hand and all of that. So they measure this calcium phosphorus ratio in the bone. They can measure different ratios and against the bone carbonate. And, and it proves man is closer to a turtle and an elephant, and the monkey is close in this ratio to a goose, and a dog is close to a horse, but not similar to a cat. You look at a, you think animals of different, of similar sizes would have different bone or similar bone characteristics, but it's like, well, obviously that doesn't work out either. So there's lots, there's more of these, um, and they, I didn't list them all on this page because some of them got into these chemical rings and the stuff that just seemed a little more complex than, than helpful in this context. But we look at this, there's, you know, abnormal, abnormalities, there's, there's instances where it's counter to what you would expect. Um, it just doesn't fit the picture that they try to make that everything is all identical. Another place that we get into this is when you think about our skin. Think about, you know, we're all common animals, and then some have scales, and some have feathers, and some have fur. We almost have fur. Um, but how are all of these types of skin common or come from a common ancestor. Even the way that it works, um, 
a feather developed from a different layer of the skin, and it's a different developmental path. It's also interesting to see that um, when they look in the fossil record, the first known feather, the oldest, you know, which they would claim was millions of years old, feather, looks like a feather. It doesn't look like a scale with a little bit of fur around the edge or something. It's a feather. And so there's not this gradual transition from a scale to skin or a gradual transition shown in the fossil record to feathers. It's just, they're just different. <clears throat> so again, things are not all matched as, claim, as close as they would claim. Um, any comments here? Okay, so we look at this and we consider, um, you know, Darwin predicted that there were these commonalities, but they see it and the things we've talked about, it doesn't match up. And they're going, okay, okay. But now, in today's scientific world, we can study things at the molecular gene level. And that is going to prove evolution. Once we start looking at the detail at a molecular level, we're going to be good as gold is what their claim is. Not only does molecular genetics provide the most convincing evidence for evolutionary, evolutionary continuity, but the evidence should impress a public that is well aware of the power of science in other areas. Um, this comes from Bernard Davis um, from Harvard Medical School. So we should be impressed that they're going to study um, this at that level and it's going to prove this out. And then, of course they prove, they also have admitted that, okay, so when you look at for homology in other areas, it didn't really quite work out as Darwin predicted. But this is going to be it. So this is going to be the proof that we need. And as we continue on, um, that there, there's a Dr. Patterson from the British Museum of Natural History. And he, he said data on amino acid sequences for hemoglobins of vipers, crocodiles, and chickens. He studied snakes, crocodiles, and chickens. Okay, I don't know what got him to pick those three, um, but that's what he picked. And so he starts studying this at the molecular level for looking for common ancestors. And he's going to look at the similarities in the DNA. And one would guess, one would make their hypothesis that the snake and the crocodile are going to have the most similar DNA. That would be, you know, you look at them and you go, they're the most related. Okay, anyone want to guess which are the two closest? I kind of gave a hint. So. <laughs> so the two that have the most DNA match are the crocodile and the chicken. And their DNA matches at 17.5% of the amino acids are common. The snake and the chicken is 10.5% and the two reptiles come in at 5.6%. So it shows the DNA is about basically three times as much common between the chicken and the crocodile. And it, I'm thinking it may be that the crocodile's been eating chicken, and therefore it's, you know, shows up that way. They both so, start with C. Yeah. That's the relationship. Yeah, I just thought this was pretty funny when you get um, and look at how, you, you know, scientifically, you know they're thinking, yeah, we're going to prove something here. We're going to show these two are the same. And then the answer is, man, that didn't work out like we wanted. So if we think about that, um, and we think about how evolution has to be gradual, you know, step to step to step over these millions and millions of years, then the, the evolutionary model would predict that there's going to be an increase in chromosome numbers 
as things move up the evolutionary scale. So you take simple, simple animal and it's not going to be at the top of the chromosome numbers because for something to be more evolved it has to gain chromosomes. If you lost a chromosome you would die. You know, each chromosome has thousands or hundreds of thousands of pieces of information that make up how, who you are, and you lose one, it would not work out. So you, you could gain one in theory, but you can't lose them. So, and I, I know the little chart there on, on the bottom of the page is a little bit um, hard to read or small, but when you look at what the science would predict, when you move from simple at the bottom of the chart on the left side, from crawfish to fern to reptiles to a gull to a bat to a dog and the man. So this is the prediction. But then the chromosome counts don't work out that way. So a bat has 32. Man comes in second from the bottom at 46. I thought we'd been at the top. Reptiles are 48. A gull is 68, a dog is 78, so we knew dogs were smart. They're about twice as smart as we are. <laughs> um, a crawfish, um, they taste good, um, but they come in at 200, and a fern, 512. So if you were to look at the counts, this would tell you that a fern um, is sitting there. When you walk by on the trail, the fern's looking at you going, what is that thing? <laughs> Doesn't it know any better? Um, unless you want to be a fern, then if you're a fern, you're the top of the evolutionary chain. Um, I thought that was entertaining. To, it, just when you look at this and it's not matching up, you're going, hmm, okay. Makes you wonder why the scientists today are so dense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't wonder. You know, common sense tells us that anything that shares a common ancestry would have the same number of chromosomes. You know, if it was all matched up perfectly and we want to be the one at 46, then everything would have 46 chromosomes. But that's not how it works out. Um, so I mentioned before certain animals, um, the a mosquito and a nematode, a nematode worm, have six. Okay, so that's very few. Um, a nematode's these little bitty worms, you can't see them, they're in the soil. Um, if you grow a garden and you keep growing tomatoes in the same part of the garden, the nematodes will get in there and they'll attack the roots of your tomatoes and they won't produce as well year to year. Okay, um, I knew this because my dad he, he was an entomologist, and we would spray and poison the garden for nematodes because that was important to him. And he had this, this tool that would inject poison. You'd fill it in the tank, and you'd push it in the ground with your foot and pump it, and it would shoot it out. And then that didn't kill them all. It did a little bit. And then so one year, he, he was like, we're going to poison the garden with chloroform. <laughs> And he said, you go down to the Purina store and get two canisters of chloroform. I'm like, they won't sell me chloroform. I'm a kid, you know. <laughs> and, and he goes, here, take my license. And he had a license. He could buy any chemical, pesticide, anything he wanted. And he said, take this down there. And so we bought chloroform. I thought that was kind of interesting. Brought it back to the house. And he explained to me. He knew all about this. And it would be very detailed. Because he, he wasn't one of these like you're going to go out in a Tyvek suit. Because we're going to worry about, he knew what parts of you the chemical would affect. You know, so there was stuff he wore goggles for, but most things, you know, maybe a pair of rubber gloves or whatever. But when we got to that one, I recall he was like, okay, we had plastic on the garden and weighted down. And he goes, now you're going to stick that canister under there, and I'm going to count from three, and on the count of one, you clip the little, there's a little latch that lets the, the fumes come out. And he said, you're going to clip that down. And you're going to run to the house. <laughs> you're going to hold your breath when I get the three. And you hold your breath till you get to the house, and you run with your arm behind you so that the wind will blow any of it off. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's what we did. 
and kill nematodes with their six, their, their <laughs> count of six. Um, so as we mentioned, you know, a fern has a high count, a black mulberry has 308 for their chromosome number. There's a simple protozoa that has over 800. So a little single cell animal with a chromosome number of over 800. Um, chimpanzees beat us out, they're at 48. Um, the Chinese moot jack, it's a small deer found in Taiwan, has 46. So we must be related to Chinese deer um, as we have 46. I already mentioned that um, you can't lose chromosomes and as things evolve, it would never, I mean, animals have had, man has had 46 chromosomes the whole time. It doesn't change for an animal, it's a constant. If you were to lose one, you'd lose millions of vital body factors. It's, a, it's just a constant for every kind of animal. As, as was pointed out by Eldon Gardner said, to put it another way, humans always have had 46 chromosomes and chimps have all had 48. So we look at this and we, we see um, there are other factors that come into place. Um, the cytochrome C, shows that a gray whale is more common with a duck than any other mammal. Um, the monkey and the bullfrog are common with a fruit fly and a rabbit with a dogfish. Um, cytochrome C are closely related chickens to penguins, ducks to pigeons, turtles are closer to birds than snakes. Again, this the point is at the molecular level, they it kind of proved out at the at the higher level it doesn't really work out. The common sense doesn't make it match up. So then they went to this molecular level and they look at DNA and it doesn't match up when they look at the DNA numbers. Then they look at the cytochrome C and it doesn't match up. Um, and so you, you look at all these different things and none of it matches. Back to the nematode. Um, you know, you remember that they mapped the Human Genome Project. So they mapped human DNA, the whole thing. Well, they also did that for nematodes. I don't know why they picked nematodes, but they did. And of the 5,000 best known human genes, 75% of them match up with the nematode worm. Okay, now we don't look quite like them, but that match, 75% um, identical match between a worm and humans. Um, I thought that was interesting. Textbooks, teachers still proclaim humans and chimpanzees are 95 to 98 percent identical, which is not true. 